I'm Spencer Bailey. This is Time Sensitive. Hey everyone, this week on the podcast, I'm joined in the studio by the lighting designer, Lindsay Edelman. Lindsay may first and foremost be identified as a designer, but she can and should also be viewed as an artist and sculptor. Through her Craft Forward studio, she creates pieces that hover between sculpture and design and explore the tensions between organic and industrial forms and materials, combining hand-blown glass with industrial and machine-milled components. Since launching her eponymous studio in 2006, Lindsay has built a formidable business, perhaps becoming best known for her branching bubble chandeliers, a series of works that look as their name suggests, glass bubbles elegantly mounted on the ends of brass, bronze, or nickel branches. Also through her company, Lindsay runs an experimental space called La Lab as a means of exploring and meditating on illumination through the creation of one-off and limited edition pieces and private commissions. Shortly before recording this episode, and a big part of why I wanted to have her on the show, Lindsay let me know that she would soon be shifting her company away from a production model and toward a studio model, moving the majority of in-house production to external partners to free up more time for her to further explore her creativity and artistry. Rather than looking for continual expansion or to sell her company, Lindsay told me she had decided that she wanted to make more space for her creative life even as her business has reached new heights. On the episode, we talk about this approach, or right-sizing as I see it, and her motivations for the shift, which have their roots in her time as a student at RISD and match her desires to work in smaller, slower, more intimate, and artisanal ways. Among other things, we also discuss the idea of dematerialization as central to the future of design and the various writers and artists who have shaped her thinking over the years including Agnes Martin, James Terrell, and Haruki Murakami. After the recording, Lindsay called me to emphasize that she forgot to mention two key artists for her, so I'll just name them here, Wangechi Mutu and Pipilati Rist. Before we get into the episode, I'd first like to thank our Season 10 presenting sponsor, Lecole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. With the mission of sharing the art and culture of jewelry with the general public, Lacole's offerings range from courses on art history and introductory jewelry making and gemology to books and publications. From public lectures and talks to exhibitions such as Stage Jewels of the Comédie Française and Golden Treasures, 3,000 Years of Chinese Ornaments. Lacole also has a new podcast called Voice of Jewels, through a combination of narration and insights from art historians, jewelry experts, and Lacole lecturers, each episode delves into the secrets and lore behind history's most mythic jewels. Season 4 explores famous jewels from comic books, including the Infinity Gauntlet, the super-powered bejeweled glove in the eponymous Marvel series, and One Piece, the elusive treasure of the heart of Ichiro Oda's legendary manga series. Season 5, meanwhile, investigates the legends of pearls including those worn by Elizabeth Taylor, Marilyn Monroe, and a Renaissance queen. You can find all five seasons on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about Lacole and Voice of Jewels, head to www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now, here's my conversation with Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Hey, Spencer. Thanks for having me. So as I was preparing for this, I was obviously this moment in time. We're speaking the morning after Kamala Harris at the DNC. And I was thinking about her as a pathbreaker, as somebody who reflects not just this moment in culture, but the place of all the people who did work before her Mm -hmm. and all the incredible women who are now at the top of their fields, Mm -hmm. respectively. And I think about the world of design and immediately I think of you (laughs) as this incredible pathbreaker who has 
shaped and mentored the next generation, but someone who also, I think, was a pioneer in a field largely run and led by men. So yeah, let's start there. Uh, what do you? <laughs> what's your response to that? I guess what What do you make of this moment in time when it comes to Kamala and mm-hmm. just thinking about that? Mm-hmm. Well, that's put me in an instant amazing mood. That is a huge <laughs> compliment of a comparison. Thank you. At the time where I was coming up, really the people that influenced me, that I admired, the sort of icons I looked to were all men. And I really didn't think about it too much. Like for me, going through school and industrial design and emerging into the workplace, into the design industry, I don't know, I didn't... I still don't really think that much about gender, you know, when I think about people. And so I was inspired by Ingo Maurer and Gaetano Pesce and the way they were using sculptural sensual elements and making it part of product. And so the first time I saw that was really in Milan. And it kind of allowed me to dream bigger. And I felt it just resonated so much more deeply than work I had previously seen. I feel like I kept following just my excitement more than anything. It wasn't as if I had a goal or even a career in mind or a path or I wasn't really conscious of trying to break through to a new level. You weren't thinking about a glass ceiling. I wasn't. There was no. Yeah, I see my glass globes mainly at the time. (laughs) Um, I was not at all. And I. I'm not sure why. It's not something I was self-conscious of. And going to all of the design events, and it was mostly dudes, but they were like fun and funny. That's pretty much what I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking, wow, this is like really frustrating to break into. And then there were certain things that I had to overcome, like even just making some of the first fixtures and going to a machine shop. And back then it was just like, you know, a guy smoking and like, a cinder block of a machine shop kind of thing with like girly calendars and you'd go in you know with all of my specs and and they would sort of look at you and be like so is your boyfriend going to show up with the project or you know and I kind of just had to laugh my way through it and make the work and it just didn't really hold me back so much what do you make, I guess, of, of the moment beyond you, your experience and watching Kamala last yes. night? I mean, it's phenomenal. Even thinking about how quickly the country has come around to how we perceive her. It's just like a handful of months people thought that she was cold, withdrawn. Like she really didn't have a chance to shine as vice president. She was sort of in the shadows. And so that's an amazing thing as well. Like we are so open and receptive to something good. We're craving a purity in our leadership, right, for this country and the way that she she's such a natural. And it was a thrill last year to be able to meet with her in person, and I was invited. Wait, wait, wait. You met with <laughs> what? <laughs> so I know. What an honor. So I designed a light for her home in D.C., and the her home is designed by Sheila Bridges, and I was invited to be a part of that. And what I love is that they really emphasized American-made work, things that are using a lot of traditional craftsmanship, but all in our country. And so it was a really intimate dinner, which honestly, I, this is kind of funny, like I didn't realize. They're like, be there at six. And I was like, oh, I'm sure it's going to be 150 people, cocktail hour, dinner, you know. And I arrived in like Secret Service. I'm like coming up the driveway and they're like, uh, Lindsay Adelman's arrived. And I was like, oh, have I messed this up? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I arrived and it was all fine. And she comes in the room and she is just electric. And her husband, like they... They are so warm and welcoming. And then having this privilege of sitting across the table from her at dinner, I was just like, this is someone who is truly 
put on this earth to do this job. I hope she goes all the way to the top. It's like her dedication to service and her love of holding court, telling stories, kind of seeing through differences. She kept bringing things together for these commonalities, even just amongst us at the table. She sort of like just rises above any small, trivial issues that we might get caught up in. She just sort of like sees right through it and is just with this huge heart, so much love, so much strength, and like told these funny stories like, like her favorite time in the house so far was when she hosted a hip hop party. And I was like, that sounds amazing. She's like, yeah, because I called Lil Wayne and he came to perform. I'm like, you're so cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've been using the word joy in the campaign. But for me, uh, the term common sense also keeps getting brought yeah. up. And for me, that's the term, like common yeah. sense. I actually feel like they should just do a campaign Kamala sense. Yeah. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, there is something about joy and pleasure, and that is a rebellion to embrace that in the face of such suffering and misery and darkness in the world. It's pretty brave to be optimistic at a time like this and radical and rare, and she exudes that. It sounds like you're describing light. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Well, you're someone who's spent a lot of time thinking about playing with and sculpting light. And so I wanted to ask, what to you are the most beautiful light sources? Mm. I love flame. I love fire at night. I love dim spaces. I'm not really that into bright, glaring midday light. I really think there's something beautiful about sunrise and sunset. I think it's that tension between light and darkness when you're aware of them both existing is when light is the most beautiful. You recently had this exhibition of oil lamps Mm -hmm. called A Realm of Light at Tiwa Gallery here in New York, which centered around the idea of slowing down, something we Mm -hmm. think a lot about here at Time Sensitive, and also ritual and ceremony. Tell me about your thinking behind those particular objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a pleasure to do that show and love the experience of working with Tiwa. The work, it is connected to time for sure. And working with an old fashioned, historically, significant material to make light. There's kind of like a depth and a heaviness to it. It goes back 6,000 years, and I was studying these ceramic oil lamps used in ancient Greece and Byzantine times, and it was olive oil, and then the cotton wick would sort of lay on its side, and these were carried, you know, through hallways. They were both functional and used in rituals and ceremonies. So just kind of carrying that tradition forward already infuses the whole project with so much meaning. But yeah, instead of switching on a light switch, I designed a matchbox and a snuffer. And you're just aware of before the light and after the light when you're really, yeah, lighting each wick and the way they glow and hang. It felt more like playing with these raw elements to illuminate a space rather than something that's rather automatic or not so conscious, which can happen in design. We can get into these habits of assumptions. This is what a light is. This is how you illuminate a room. And so rising out of that, why? Like, What else can it be? How else can we experience this? And I often think about light as dictating behavior in the room, too. So if I want people to whisper, share secrets, or have it be more intimate, or as some sort of mystery or murkiness to the situation, I kind of go towards those forms and materials. I think it's worth mentioning right now that we're 
sitting in a recording studio <laughs> with, <laughs> with Isamu Noguchi's Akari light sculptures yeah. to your left and right. <laughs> yeah, it feels pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> a neighboring street to the studio, Poplar Street in Brooklyn Heights, actually has some of the last remaining street gas lamps mm -hmm. in New York City. I love that they're still there. Like mm -hmm. there's this, I don't know, the fact that there's somebody from the city who comes and still tends to these flames when they go yeah, out. Yeah. There's something really remarkable about that. So beautiful. I know, like keeping this torch alive from the past. Yeah, I guess there aren't very many left. I didn't realize that, but you definitely always notice them when you come across them, or maybe in other countries it's more prevalent. Yeah, it's pretty magical. It's because flame's alive. It's moving and responding, and electric lights don't do that. What do you think are the worst sources of light? <laughs> I mean, for me, it has to be these new LED street light posts that have been going up all over New York mm -hmm. City the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. They're blindingly bright at night yeah. to the point that it's awful to look outside. Yeah, I know. I think when I see lights like that, I can hear it also. I don't know if you do too. It's like alarms going off. I like my whole body is like <laughs> just like so an tempted. assault to the I've senses. Been so tempted to write this like op-ed screed about how yeah. terrible they are. Yeah. Because it's like I get it. You're trying to provide light for passers by and create safe neighborhoods, but you're actually destroying the entire aura of a city in the I process. Know. I, I mean, know. There's already enough light. It's New York City. Come yeah, on. it's pretty lit up, right? And I feel like that type of light is kind of everywhere if you're looking for it. And it's just, you know, I not everyone is sensitive like us, right? So it's not necessarily a priority or on people's radar and people that are sensitive to it. It's really, hard. it hurts. Yeah, I'm time sensitive, but I'm also yeah. light sensitive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Could you share any particular transformative experiences with light that come to mind for you? Something that shifted your perception, mm. your life maybe, or even mm. or how you think about the world? Mm. Wow. Have I ever had? Well, a couple of things just came to mind. One was when I did a silent meditation retreat, which was out in Yosemite. And it was seven days of silence and we did meditation a few times a day. And we gathered on this deck outside of all these redwoods around probably a bit before 6 a.m. And so when you would arrive and take your seat and close your eyes, you're in moonlight. And after the 20 minutes, we would open our eyes all together and it would be the sunrise. And that was transformative. It felt like holding on to time, actually, of how much happened with our eyes closed in 20 minutes. And you felt a deep, almost eerie connection to what's holding us. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a, a James Terrell a little bit. There's yeah, something ter yeah. Terrell-like about that description. I yeah. mean, I I think about some of the most miraculous, I would even use that word, experiences with light. And for me, it has to be probably moments inside James Terrell environments, whether in Japan or Mass Mocha or even MoMA PS1 sitting in that room looking up at the sky. yeah. Oh, the, this works brilliant. And I don't know if we're talking about the same place in Japan. Did you spend the night in the house no. that he designed? So I spent the night there. <laughs> and you reserve it for four people. It's a private house. And the whole thing was so magical because it was like maybe a couple hours outside of Tokyo. And it's almost like the town that it's in doesn't think it's that big of a deal or something like that. So you walk in and everything's just like super low key and you have this like gorgeous dinner delivered to you and these like bed rolls on top of your tatami mats. There's like a little hot tub spa in the bottom floor. It's so beautiful, but at the same time, it's like 
simple. It doesn't feel fancy. So then you all get in your little sleeping bags. And when night falls, the roof retracts. It's this perfect square that's framing the night sky. And then the super subtle Terrell light show around the perimeter of this square. So the four of us, as with three of my very close friends, are like, the sky's yellow, the sky's purple, the sky's green. And then after a while, it just closes up and it's time to sleep. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that I guess you could say was transformative. Oh, well. And then it started to snow. <laughs> Just beyond. And there's something about the light in Japan. Must be where it's positioned on the sea and the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the story behind Noguchi's Akari sculptures mm -hmm. is also really interesting in that respect. Mm -hmm. The first light he ever created, he called Lunar Infant. And oh, I didn't it know stemmed that. out of his experience as a young boy looking out the window of a house in Japan at the moon mm. and seeing this floating light sculpture in the sky mm. or that's at least the romantic story he uh. would tell of course it's more complex and dynamic than that because it also has to do with technology something i'm sure we'll talk about today mm. of rethinking these old paper lanterns mm -hmm. that were used for rituals floating candles down the down the uh, river or mm -hmm. um you know, objects in the corner of a room with a candle under them kind of lit up by this washi paper, mm -hmm. but transporting that into the technological moment of the mid-century, mid-20th century by adding an incandescent bulb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's interesting to think about this line from <laughs> Noguchi to Terrell. And Absolutely. Yeah. And thinking about Noguchi's body of work, and the focus on sculpture and then the way he partnered with industry to get this idea fabricated is an amazing model for me also to look to and how he very comfortably did both is, yeah, it's an inspiration for me and that they are different yet both hold such value like his lighting is such a contribution to society in so many ways and there's a reason that it's still feels so just lovable and relevant the glow the glow <laughs> what ways if any do you think light impacts our sense of time yeah so many ways i mean as we were just talking about how it affects our emotions so much and i think our emotions have a huge impact on how we experience time. We notice things when we want to notice things, which usually means that there is some element of beauty or gentleness or love, or we feel like we've been giving credit to notice something or that we're, we connect with something, something resonates. It's like when we're in that space to notice so much, an hour feels like a day. And when things are harsh, which can be related to light, but we want that time to go back by fast, right? And it does. And so like I think about that a lot with travel and how the days seem so long or I go out to LA fairly often and I'm going to go pretty soon and I feel like I have a week and a day every time I'm there. And I think it's a combination of the quality of light, but I th also – of all the newness, you're not in a habit anymore, even if I'm there for a while, like 10 days or something. So working, you can kind of, time is elastic, it is responsive. And the more you kind of tap into that, I think the more you like squeeze out of life. Are there any texts about light that you reference or that have shaped your understanding of illumination. Mm. For me, it has to be Junichiro Tanizaki's In Praise of Shadows. Right. But what comes to mind for you? Mm -hmm. I know I had mixed feelings about that book, but... It is also racist. I mean, the, yeah, the, book's, com that. the book's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, the first thing that comes to mind is the writings of Agnes Martin. And I don't know if she really specifically 
talks about light in a literal way, but I think the whole thing is about light and darkness and the plainness of it, where she takes these very abstract concepts or moments and is able to form words around it. It really does mimic the visuals um, and her drawings, paintings, prints. And it's almost like she allows us to see something without seeing it. It's sort of like we're using our whole bodies to see. And her work carries a tremendous amount of optimism as well, even though when you look at her life story, she went through like terrible treatments for her mental illness, survived all that, and then the places where she writes and where she paints from, they feel like so elevated above everyday life and this perspective that's sort of like hovering like right next to the sun, you know? I feel like it's just embodying something so bright and also so natural like the universe is inside of her and I like that in writing in general I know I'm not really talking about writing about light right now but like I think when it embodies a lightness it's these crisp simple words that can capture huge ideas beyond this life we can see with our eyes yeah I mean, I, hearing you say that, I immediately think of Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness yes. of Being. That would be, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, or the, the work of Jhumpa Lahiri, who we've had on this show, actually. Oh, wow. I think of lightness when I think of her work. Yes. It also makes me think of art. I mean, obviously, you have been heavily influenced by art. And I recently spoke with Hiroshi Sugimoto on this podcast. I to that. We didn't get into light so much, although we did talk a little bit about that in relation to his seascapes. He is truly a master of light, I would say. Truly, yeah. Yeah, as so many artists are. And I think probably we each individually experience light in different ways so that probably feels different to each one of us and what we notice, what we notice about light and how we're affected by it, I think is so individual. And yeah, the number of artists that I am, there are like very few artists that I'm not inspired by. So it gets kind of overwhelming. Yeah. I think we should say here that a lot of your work does fit squarely in what we would call design, but it also exists at the level of art. And and some of your pieces, I would say even fall more into that art category. And over the years, you've pulled all these influences. I'm thinking, you know, Eva Hess's rope sculptures. I know you've mentioned the films of David Lynch before. There's the sculptures of Louise Bourgeois, the paintings of Leonor Fini. Maybe just elaborate a little bit on your taste in art and and how it finds its way or wends its way Mm -hmm. into your work. Yeah. I like work that feels brave and also where I'll say the method of construction is a bit transparent. So it feels sort of like accessible. I I love going to shows where I'm just fired up to go back to my studio to make something. And whether that's just through a lot of manual labor of like something repeated over and over, some sort of like process or gesture And then I just love when people turn mundane materials into something that's like super ethereal, but I also like work that's sort of, that can be really jarring. I love Paul McCarthy, for example, (laughs) like that installation at the Park Avenue Army, which was quite a while ago, has really stayed with me. And I make video also. And so I think about pieces that, or like, and Matthew Barney too, actually, when you're using like objects or materials as props and then using them in a film and then the film is telling a story of what happened and you're sort of like looking at the aftermath or residue of it. Like, even though my work doesn't really look like that, I I think what I'm interested in 
is this fine line between reality and fantasy and going back and forth. And something that I quite love about being a designer is that it's like an interception or an intervention into people's daily life, but it's also like hacking into their fantasies. So especially with the specific niche that we're in, it's a lot about reading how people are envisioning like how they'd like to see themselves or you know when people are working on a home they're often working on this is the life I prefer to have like this is the path I want to take in my future this is how I'm envisioning my friends coming over and seeing me like there's something that's that is it's subtle and it's not really people can't necessarily put words to it it's not overt but I like to tap into that. And so playing with that space of like in and out of fantasy reality, I was just thinking about the the writing of Murakami, which I'm sure you're a huge fan. And like that going, going back and forth, fantasy, reality, fantasy, reality, where's the line? And so designing from that space is forever interesting. There are no rules. And it's kind of like, okay, I'm using materials like bronze or glass But what I'm forming is something that we're not familiar with. The work I wanted to have always some element of comfort so that we can go there and someone puts it over a dining table. But it's like, how far can you push it into fantasy? And people sometimes are drawn to things and they don't know why. And that's the best, right? So yeah, I designed from that space. And I think the longer... I'm in that space, the more I can kind of harness it and get my arms around it and more efficiently actually do something with that, with that fantasy space. Hey, everyone. Taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our Season 10 presenting sponsor, Lacole School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. In addition to its courses, lectures, publications, and other programming, Lacole also has a new podcast called Voice of Jewels, which draws on knowledge from its lecturers, researchers, and other experts to uncover the stories and secrets behind history's most fascinating jewels. The first five seasons, respectively titled Sentimental Jewels, The Blue Diamonds' 1001 Lives, The Gold's Amazing Saga, Iconic Jewels of Comic Books, and The Legend of Pearls are now available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Upcoming seasons will explore the themes of talismans and the relationship between jewelry and literature. You can learn more about Lacole and Voice of Jewels at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleef. A R P E L S dot com. And now back to the episode. I do want to sort of transition here into your love of hosting because I think it's relevant when we talk about time. You you host these gatherings of friends, often around meditative rituals such as sound baths. You've done figure drawing sessions, and even as was covered in the New York Times, a a two-hour cacao ceremony. (laughs) So I assume you've read Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, or if you haven't, you should. Okay. (laughs) And I guess my question here is, what is it about these gatherings Mm -hmm. that so moves you, and what compels you to host them and Mm -hmm. create them? Yes, it's so similar to my craving for designing lighting, which is so much about setting up the situation for then real life to happen within it. And so with the gatherings, I'm really interested in how I can make people feel either about themselves, about each other, what their experience is. And I also love hosting dance parties which I feel are sacred, you know, and I think it's interesting because they all, all of these things have a bit of dimness to them. So I love the idea as a designer of creating objects for an experience, whether that's setting up an altar or doing oil lamps or 
or even like juxtaposing unusual things like ancient things and new things. And then I love assembling a guest list. I love yeah. doing a seating chart. I love thinking about cocktail hour on one floor and then a seated dinner on another floor. I love thinking about the whole experience of sidewalk into space. One event I had last year, the RSVP list got pretty out of control. So we decided to use multiple floors in our space. And then for crowd control, I was like, let's use the freight elevator to get the bodies up here. But then we just put like a giant boom box in the freight elevator and put a light in there and like dim the whole thing. So the party kind of started from the back sidewalk. I feel like that's like part of like why I'm here. Do you know what I mean? Is Are these gatherings and extending appreciation and connection and and having this other like force kind of take over it's electric when you set something up like that and I get kind of a high off of even more, like being around other people's connections unexpected conversations and there's this spiritual side to you that we have to mm-hmm. get into here like if I, if I can call it that mm-hmm. um, <laughs> How do you think that informs your life and work? Yeah, deeply. Yeah, it's not random that I learned how to meditate the same year I founded my company. 2006. You got it. (laughs) And that was a big deal for me. When I learned it was transcendental meditation. and, And with that, I'm able to drop in really deep and the rest of the world sort of recedes and there's a spirituality to it it's almost like you can keep living the same life but it's sort of like this secret door to enjoying it more there's more softness and patience and observation like I'm able to notice the space like between two people the space between words the space between decisions the space between an inhale and an exhale that I didn't have before before that I felt like life almost had me on like a collar and a leash and I was just like pleasing you know just sort of whatever responding to demands rather than being my own inner authority leading things and so for me, spirituality is actually very practical. On many le- levels, it's not separate from life. And and then, yeah, I have a deep belief that there is something greater than us at work and that that governs everything and it's connected to our subconscious. I certainly have a lot of practices and rituals that allow me to pay attention to my subconscious and Without that, it's driving the bus anyway. So if we can tap into it and give it some compassion and patience, we have a chance to actually direct our lives in a more meaningful way. And I think in a way that has more of an impact on those around us. And even if there's still mystery around it, we don't even need to be that specific, but like just being tapped into it and letting ourselves be carried by it. For me, that's my experience of spirituality. Meditation as a guiding light to make light. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) There's also this notion of letting go that connects to this. And we probably should have started the interview here, but it's okay. We're here now. You have some major news that you'll be announcing soon after we record this, that after nearly 20 years of, running your company, you're going to shift from a production model to a studio model with the majority of your in-house production moving to external partners. In essence, at least this is how I read it, you're downsizing your in-house production to upsize your creativity and your artistry. Could you share why you're doing this and what your goals are? Yeah, so every couple years I keep introducing a new collection and we keep expanding and making more and more work and I've come to a point where I don't want to keep doing that ad infinitum you know I want to again be a bit more 
conscious of who am I now. I'm different than when I first started my studio. And the success of the collections is something that I didn't anticipate. I didn't anticipate everything to still be relevant. And I kind of expected things to peel off more over the years. And we've been lucky enough that most of them are still going. No one's going to tell me to make less. No one's going to tell me to return to a smaller studio practice. So I need to tell myself that. So I think, you know, my original intention with studio was always really about design coming first, experimentation, exploration, innovation. And as it keeps growing, it becomes more about managing manufacturing and filling orders. And, you know, I've loved it. Like, I've loved so much of it. But I think there's other parts of me that I owe it to, to explore and discover. There's more sides of me and my creative expression that I want to give a chance to find out what's there. And something's got to give. Like, I can't do everything. I can't do it all. And so, yeah, so we have worked with um, one manufacturer for a really long time who's done, like, partial production and assembly for us and but they're able to make an entire fixture from like the raw stock of brass all the way to the finished goods and I'm going to shift and lean into that and so we won't be manufacturing so many of the collections in-house and we'll be producing the specialty work in-house and yeah just giving myself the time and space to find out what else is in me that wants to come out. There's really no other way of saying it. It's not even like a clear like agenda. It's more just I know something has to peel away in order for something else to grow. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a radical act. Maybe to the listeners, not in the world of design, it doesn't sound like one, but I mean, to anyone running a company... It is a a radical act. Most people in your position would probably consider selling, which you could have done, or just keep growing it and sort of business as usual, keep it going as it is. But you chose not to. Yeah. Why? (laughs) Yeah, it is radical, but starting the company was also radical. It didn't make any sense at the time. And so I feel like for me, it's the same. It's so important to me to pay attention to this inner drive and this path that's sort of like unfolding before me. That's really why it's sort of like honoring what I know to be true inside of me. I mean, creativity is a really mysterious thing. It's not like a manual or a program and one person's creativity is unlike anybody else's and I have a relationship with my creativity, right? I mean, it sounds so hokey, but It's true. It's sort of big and small. It's like hands-on if I'm just working on a clay pot one day, but it's also so big. Like There's this onslaught of ideas that come to me, and I, I can't always find out about all of them. I can't always follow all these paths, and I want to carve out some space to be able to do that. So changing to a slightly different studio model and changing the intention and the focus on more exploration and prototyping and collaboration and expanding the materials we work with, et cetera. It is a decision that has been internal and that now I'm taking to the external. And it's not easy because again, like when things are good, It seems like it's not like you're going to get a tremendous amount of support to be like, you should change everything. It's going really well, you know. So it's a hard decision and one that I've struggled with for a while. My team is phenomenal and there'll be fewer of them. But everyone is in studio now because they're an overachiever. Like they deliver, they perform and we're like a family. And so I actually have this strange faith 
that I'll receive support, even from people that are receiving news about change in their life that they might not want. And I'm really proud of the deep relationships and sort of mutual respect that we've created in our studio culture. I feel like the definition of success is shifting for me. My goals are shifting. And so the way I define if I've had a successful year or not is going to be different. And I want it to be more about my bravery, really, and sort of walking an unknown path and seeing where this goes. And I think as you get older, it's harder and harder to change, actually. There is the notion <laughs> we, we become stuck in our ways. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like when you're in your 20s, it's not that big of a deal. But in your 50s, yeah, it feels more whatever, nerve wracking. Mm. But that explains a bit about the yeah. impetus behind it. Yeah. Well, scale is something I wanted to bring up because most people, or maybe not most people, culture generally at large, at least though, does have this sensibility or feeling that bigger is always better. Mm -hmm. But I think you and I both agree, bigger is not mm. always better. Mm. And, and in a society that's largely driven by growth and speed, there can be a certain power in slowing down mm -hmm. and making less stuff in your case, mm -hmm. <laughs> fewer, better things. Right. I imagine this decision was super uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. Painstaking even. And I guess, you know, you've mentioned a little bit about success, but what's your ultimate outcome or dream with this? What would be something that you would love to see happen? Yeah. That's such a great question. You know, in a way, I feel like I'm in the middle of it now because even experiencing this change and taking action, I feel a vibration just from that. I feel like the future will look like my present. So if I'm changing the present and jumping in with two feet into something very new, the future will look different. I think I would do the future a disservice by trying to visualize it too specifically because it would be based on who I am now and what I know now. And I hope to be one year different <laughs> in the future. It's a very beautiful <laughs> spiritual sentiment. Thank you. Hey everyone, taking another quick break here to tell you about our weekly newsletter where I share a behind-the-scenes look into each time-sensitive episode and also get into various things in the cultural sphere I'm paying attention to. You can sign up and join our 11,000 other subscribers by going to slowdown.media slash newsletter. That's slowdown.media slash newsletter. And now, back to the episode. While we still have some time, I wanted to bring up your first product, I believe is your very first product or one of your first products, the branching bubble chandelier. And I bring this up because I'm sure half or more than half or many of our listeners don't even know it. Maybe they've seen it, but don't know that that's what it is. Yeah. It quickly became a hit product when it came out. I think it certainly can be argued that it's one of the more influential lights in recent years or of the early 21st century. What do you make mm -hmm. of this, of its success? Why has the bubble chandelier been so copied, mimicked, knocked off, mm -hmm. yeah. transported around the globe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it really hit a nerve at the time, and it really like tapped into some desire I feel like at the time and I think it was maybe both on a, like a practical level and an emotional level like I built a system where light could in a very functional way sort of travel around the room using a real economy of materials actually like the whole like a 10 foot long branching chandelier you know before we build it it fits into like a shoe box like all of the, just the tubes and joints and then the globes are separate and so there was something about hitting on this structure, which is, 
you know, found in nature or like it's just 120 degree angles, really like a Bucky Fuller kind of don't like it's it's sort of using a structure that's that we know. And then the globes added this very like sensual, luxurious element to it. So hitting upon that, but then also my nature is a people pleaser. And I feel like the level I threw myself into like delivering what people wanted when they wanted it and just being, you know, in the back of the van, holding the fixture for all those like first orders and getting out, meeting the electrician, getting on the scaffolding, just listening so hard to what people wanted and negative and positive feedback. I honestly feel like that has so much to do with what shaped the company. It wasn't like magic or, and it wasn't like me designing in a vacuum. It was really listening to both what people hated and what they were into. Sometimes I feel like it's not that random because not that many people are wired to sort of throw themselves into giving the people what they want. You know what I mean? And and then the emotional aspect, like I'm a deep feeler and with all of my work, I mean, sometimes I think it's like absurd. I'm like, it's a light fixture. It's going over a dining table at the end of the day. But I go through <laughs> such, right? But like my depths of like melancholy or drama or appreciation of beauty or like an aching beauty is something I think about a lot. I mean, to make this really cheesy, mm -hmm. it's basically your light bulb moments. I mean. <laughs> yeah, so good. Um, and also, I really, like I was talking about with sculpture I love, I like when the method of fabrication is transparent, accessible. And I intentionally did that. I intentionally didn't make a system that was super smooth or swoopy it was like hunks of these little y connectors that were pretty robot-y and i because i like that tension and it also really shows anybody how to make it and then i put out an open source <laughs> light project so that we put the instructions out there and you could order off the shelf connectors from grand brass and it's still available people can still download the instructions and order it for like a hundred dollars and make their own lamp so you know i kind of put it out there of how easy it is yeah and then just like trusted that my drive to keep innovating would carry my career actually my husband said something really sweet and he said it with this lighting product i did with david weeks called lunette and then with the branching bubbles he was like it's not your last good idea and that honestly has carried me through. There's definitely now a known, quote, Lindsay Edelman aesthetic. So much so, and I need to give credit where it's due. I found this in New York Magazine's The Cut. They highlighted this, that your work even appears in Kevin Kwan's third Crazy Rich Asians book in a bizarre way, where this character attempts suicide by one of your chandeliers uh, but it fails because the chandelier breaks and <laughs> they fall. And you have quite a few celebrity fans. It, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, to name one. I guess you're you're in hopefully our future president's house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this pop culture adjacency to your work? Like, why has your work found its way into the zeitgeist? Do you mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And maybe it's connected to this fantasy world that I designed for because they're tapped into that too of what we want to look to or aspire to. We look to a lot of these people as models for our lives. And yeah, maybe maybe it has to do, like a lot of their homes are pretty over the top on so many levels and it's pretty thrilling to see them and design for them and and humans like to be like each other too so if they see it in someone else's house they're like oh i'd like some of that but i'm gonna do it in my way i think it's just like a natural it's like a natural human thing we all do it yeah it's pr we primordial be. we probably went into caves and like oh i like those cave paintings yeah <laughs> yeah those are pretty can i get a horse over here in my living room yeah <laughs> Quickly, you've also expanded your work into other realms, including jewelry, tiles, wallpaper, music videos. 
I wanted to just ask about your jewelry in particular mm-hmm. and what you think l- links jewelry with your work as a lighting designer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love designing jewelry so much and w- still will make it and as like a one-off or like a small batch occasionally. And decorating for the body or adorning the body is such an interesting challenge because it's like a moving, living thing, but it's still just using metal and jump rings and things that catch light. And there's sort of a functional part of it, designing an earring, you want it to feel comfortable on the lobe and stay there and feel light, yet you want it to have some sort of drama to it and have like motion with these like different facets or sort of joints. It's like, it's not that unlike designing for a ceiling or a wall, but it's just like a static surface. But there's something about this, yeah, metallic finishes and catching reflections and it sort of like mimics, you know, like the surface of the sea in sunlight or we we're talking about moonlight earlier. Back and to it's kind of, Yeah, yeah, <laughs> full circle. I feel like it's just all about kind of bringing these like natural phenomena inside, like into our lives. Either we want to wear it or live with it. And I certainly am always after reclaiming that fiery, elusive nature of of all the ways we experience light in the natural world. Yeah. Let's end on the future. Okay. Uh, you've previously said that the future of design in one word is dematerialization. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that. All right. <laughs> so good. Yeah, I think that's where we're headed. There's so many ways of talking about that, but I think about it on one level as like institutions crumbling and things that seemed solid turning to sand or things that we once believed are no longer true or resonate. And it does feel like a huge spiritual awakening is happening right now. And it does feel like there has to be tremendous darkness at the same time, which there is. What what I find so much in daily life is this overwhelming, it's like an urgency of closeness and possibility, potential, and envisioning something better than we've ever known. And I think that all is connected with this dematerialization. It's sort of like this veil. It's not necessarily real. What's real is what we can't see, and that's immaterial. And we're so hooked on our physical vision for reality, but I really believe that is just a tiny sliver of reality. And and I think a lot of people are getting tapped into these beautiful other worlds that have been there all the time. And how can we value those as much as we used to value the physical world we can see. Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you, Spencer. It's been such a pleasure. Extra thanks to our Season 10 presenting sponsor, Le Col, School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. A unique place for learning online and offline, Lacole welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, talks, exhibitions, videos, books, and its new Voice of Jewels podcast. You can find out more about Lacole at www.lacolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. To keep up with our latest Time Sensitive episodes and get behind-the-scenes updates, sign up for our newsletter at slowdown.media slash newsletter. That's slowdown.media slash newsletter. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.media. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, Mimi Hannon, Emily McDonald, and Johnny Simon.